Um, Father George, we'd like to introduce our speaker of the evening, the, the afternoon that's ahead of us. Again, welcome everybody. It's uh, very good to have you here. It's a real pleasure to have Cecile Barry here. Uh, she is a lecturer in French here at Oriel College and at Jesus College, and I think as you see here, she's doing her PhD at Université Périgité, and she's doing her PhD on T.S. Eliot, and the anxious body, on the physicality of emotions in T.S. Eliot. So we're going to hear the a subject which is near to her heart, and the subject of her academic work, and it's a real delight to have you today. Thank you for coming. into the Church of England in a small parish of Finstock, Oxfordshire, about 15 miles from here. He was baptised secretly because in his own words he hated spectacular conversions. About a year later he had his first confession, which he described as a moment of irreversible ascent, like the feeling of crossing a very wide and deep river. I feel certain he wrote that I shall not cross back, and that, in itself, gives one a very extraordinary sense of surrender and gain. He had found his liturgical and spiritual home in Anglo-Catholicism. For much of the rest of his life, he would attend services at St. Stephen's Church in London, pictured here, um, where he also served as a warden for 25 years. We can learn a lot about Eliot's liturgical habits from his letters to Emily Hale, his secret love interest and correspondent of 27 years. These letters have recently been published online by the Eliot Foundation after having been sealed for 50 years and pandemic too. They are remarkably unguarded and intimate. I'd like you to make some space. <laughs> it's a positive thing. I think we have room for four or five more chairs in front of us. Just maybe a couple more. This is your chance to come in. Take it or leave it. It's like Twitter We cannot let anyone come in. We've said the I'll go ahead and call you. There are three chairs in the front. Um, three chairs in the front? If anyone wants to come in, there are four. Two more here. So I guess there are five chairs. Did you come in? There are three over here. One more here. Uh, one more there. Two there. So there's another chair here. One here in the middle. No? I'm in that one. <laughs> this one here is free. <coughs> there are two more chairs. Sit here. Leave that there. That's fine. For three. Yeah. Sorry. Perfect. 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 How many more? There's a chair here. There's a chair there. Okay, perfect. Why don't you go to the front? Lovely. <coughs> lovely, lovely. There you go, Cecile. It's a positive thing. <laughs> <laughs> don't feel any pressure, though. Um, should I just sum up what I've said yeah. so far? <laughs> So, Eliot converted to Anglo-Catholicism at the age of 38 in 1927. He was baptised in a church not too far from here. 
um, and it was a very important thing in his life. Um, he <coughs> um, worshipped at the Church of St. Stephen's in London, um, where he was also a warden for 25 years. And I was just moving on to say that we've had um, a big archi archival and bailing recently, uh, which is that of the Emily Hare letters, so letters that Elliot wrote to the woman he loved, um, but never married. Um, he wrote to her for about 27 years, uh, many, many letters, about over a thousand. Um, and they give us a lot of information about many things about his life, but in particular, in, for the purposes of this lecture, um, about um, his relationship to the liturgy. Um, so I was just saying that the letters are very unguarded and intimate. Um, I am amused by the excitement with which Eliot gives Hale lists and details of the services he's attended and urges her to tell him if she's been to any special services for Holy Week. <laughs> Eliot had a strict routine of both private and public devotion. He had a particular affection for the Psalms, from which he drew comfort in difficult times, and he memorised some of them during the Second World War. He liked to say the Angelus whenever he heard the bells from his parish or from a nearby Catholic church at 8, noon and 6.30. He attended daily Mass whenever he could, usually two or three times a week. Um, he liked the pared-down simplicity of early morning communions. He mentions them a lot in his letters. Um, but we know from his prose writing that he also enjoyed the theatricality of a good high mass, mm -hmm. um, which he compared to the ballet. Anglo-Catholic liturgies would have been a big change for Eliot, um, because he was, in his own word, born and bred a Unitarian. Um, he was raised in St. Louis, Missouri, in a prominent Unitarian family from a Bostonian background, um, and as an adult, he did not have very fond memories of the services of his childhood. He described them as arid, more social than spiritual, lacking in intensity, and overly, overly reliant on the personality of the officiant. This suited neither his liturgical tastes nor his spiritual needs. On the other hand, Eliot was not a fan of Roman Catholic kit either. He once described to Emily Hale, with a form of horrified delight, his experience of attending a Roman Mass in a small Irish church near Boston, post-Anglican conversion. I noticed the tawdriness, he writes, cheap, gaudy high altar, holy family in collars, like a valentine of a birthday cake, <laughs> saints about in collars, St. Anthony of Padua and others. But this is not even the worst of it. There had been addiction after Mass, Eliot continues, and turned on some dreadful concealed pink lights in the altar to illuminate the Holy Family. <laughs> One gets the distinct impression that this would not have happened in St. Stephen's. But of course, Eliot's faith could not and should not be reduced to aesthetic preference. One of the things that he disliked about <coughs> Unitarianism was its sense of optimism about the essential goodness of man and his ability to reach moral perfection through self-improvement. As an Anglican, as an Anglican, Eliot believed in the dogma of original sin. He also believed in the Trinity and in the Incarnation. As an Anglo-Catholic, Eliot believed in the doctrines of Eucharistic sacrifice and presence in praying for the dead and in the intercession of the Virgin Mary and all saints. For him, these beliefs were fundamental. This is demonstrated by his long-running dispute with Emily Hale over her decision to take communion in Episcopalian and Anglican contexts, even though she was a Unitarian and did not believe in the Trinity. He eventually cited this dispute as one of the reasons he could not marry her. Anglo-Catholicism was important to Eliot personally, but also public, publicly. And in the 1930s, he saw himself as having become a kind of figurehead or symbol for the church. In a letter to Hale, he refers to himself as, I quote, the most conspicuous layman in the church today. 
Um, he also says he cannot end his disastrous first marriage to his wife, um, Vivian, sorry, um, by a divorce. So he cannot divorce his first wife uh, because wholly without overestimating my importance, he writes, it would be the greatest misfortune of, to the Anglican Church since Newman went over. <laughs> and, Glaston, and Gladstone called that a catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> Eliot was fascinated by the language of the liturgy. Um, in his talks and essays, he often discusses the crucial role of the Bible um, and the liturgy in general in shaping English letters and the English language. The Bible, he insists, is not literature. Its impact cannot be dissociated from the question of belief. Moreover, understanding the Bible's influence requires us to consider its use not only in private devotion, but also and primarily in the context of communal practice. I quote, however much our language owes to the regular reading aloud of Bible passages in private families, Eliot writes, I think that we owe still more to the public repetition of the liturgy. Here the quote continues, the regular, the regular audition of the lessons, the collects and the prayers must have produced a gentle and insensible saturation of the minds not only of the truly devout, but of all the steady congregation, with the beauty of some of the finest sentences and periods in the hall of English prose. At this point, Eliot's tone becomes almost lyrical, and it continues, the fall of these words upon the ear, as they follow their due and appointed order in the service, and the cyclic recurrence of the services according to the seasons, <coughs> enters into the whole rhythm of the Christian life with an unconscious compulsion. The rhythm of life is deeper than the rhythm of prose or verse. This is a crucial point to understand Eliot's engagement with the liturgy. The rhythm of life is deeper than the rhythm of prose or of verse. Liturgy is not just a text, it is a leaving, living, breathing tradition. In his home parish, Eliot would have used the English Missal. However, unsurprisingly, Eliot's literary loyalties lay for the Book of Common Prayer. The critic I.A. Richards remembered that whenever Eliot visited him in Cambridge in the late 1920s, he would come carrying a large, new, and to us awe-inspiring prayer book. A decade later, in 1939, Eliot would be one of the signatories of a manifesto defending the Catholic tradition within the Church of England that specifically stressed the importance of prayer book liturgies in Anglo-Catholic parishes. For Eliot, the impact of the prayer book on language could not be exaggerated and even exceeded the influence of the King James Bible. The English language, he wrote, owes a great deal to the Church and to such men as Cranmer, even without the translation of the Bible, our debt is almost incalculable. As a, result, as a result of the influence of liturgy on the English literary tradition, Eliot insists that the church has a responsibility towards the English language. The choices that the church makes when revising the liturgy may have profound linguistics linguistic and literary consequences. They cannot be taken lightly. We can see this aspect of Eliot's thinking at work at various points in his life. In 1927, a revised version of the 1662 prayer book was presented before Parliament and rejected. A revised, revised version <coughs> was then proposed in 1928 and rejected as well. What became known as the prayer book controversy aroused deep feelings and passionate debate all over the country. One view expressed at the time, um, notably by John Middleton Murray, 
um, was that the revised BCP was a Roman sacerdot <laughs> can't pronounce that word sacerdotalist 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 thank you very much a Roman sacerdotalist plot to get the Church of England closer to Rome and that its rejection by Parliament was a I quote blow to Anglo Catholicism. Eliot did not take kindly to this view. In an open letter published in 1928, he pointed out that many Anglo-Catholics did not, in fact, support the proposed revisions. There is reason to suspect that these many Anglo-Catholics included Eliot himself. During the previous year, in 1927, he had made it quite clear that the revised prayer book would not receive a nihil obstat from him. He points, for example, to, I quote, symptoms of decay in the wording of the preface. This is what happens, he says, when eminent ecclesiastics fail to think clearly. <laughs> he cites two examples of this decay. First, the replacement of the word incomprehensible by infinite. And second, the replacement of the word everlasting by eternal. Here is the relevant passage. <coughs> the word infinite, besides being less comprehensible than incomprehensible, <laughs> has gained a shoddy prestige from the reputable uses of the word in mathematics. Its use throws a mathematical cloak over theology. The word eternal evades all difficulties of time. Whether the words were supposed to clarify theology or not, they make the English language vaguer. We are sorry to see them receive the benediction of the prayer book in these contexts. When fences are down, the cattle will roam, including two vagrant beasts named Infinite and Eternal. <laughs> <laughs> Words which will wander so far, the, fen the fence of meaning being down, that they will cease to belong anywhere. The objection to the new prayer book, then, was that the revisions threatened to rob perfectly good English words of their clarity and precision. Eliot also went to bat for the Bible. In 1949, a Princeton theology professor, George Hendry, called for a new translation on the grounds that the King James Version contained much that was, quote, unintelligible to those of our people who have not had more than an elementary schooling in the language of literature, in language and literature. Eliot was not opposed to the idea of a new translation. By all means, let us have a new translation, he urged. Let us have several new translations. The idea being that different translations could be used for different purposes. Nor did he object to a translation that made the Bible more intelligible. Although he noted that, I quote, to make a more intelligible translation should not mean to make a translation which is easy to understand. For there is a great deal in the Bible which can never be made easy except by evacuation of content. It is, in fact, a very difficult book. Um, but what really provoked Eliot is Henry's insistence that the church's task is not to promote literary appreciation, but to, I quote, proclaim the word of God. Eliot wonders if this might be so obvious if the words promote literary <coughs> appreciation were replaced by preserve the purity, precision, and dignity of the English language. Eliot continues, if the church rewrites its Bible and its liturgy to conform with every successive stage of deterioration of the language, the prospect is gloomy. For the speech of our people is not only threadbare, but incapable of expressing exact and subtle thought. Dr. Andrew's assertion might also be enlarged to cover the whole of ecclesiastical art. For instance, the church's task is not to promote the appreciation of stained glass windows, but to proclaim the word of God. So let us have no more stained glass windows. It is important to note that when Eliot refers to the threadbare speech of our people, he is not making a comment about class. If anything, he thinks language is more alive in the lower fringes of society 
and that many of the symptoms of decay can be imputed to the intellectual elite. But the essential point is this. <coughs> Eliot does not claim that liturgical language should never be changed, but he thinks that the goal of any changes should be to achieve clarity and precision, not to eliminate difficulty. In 1962, Eliot roundly criticised the language of the New English Bible. He described its style as, quote, a combination of the vulgar, the trivial and the pedantic. One point that draws his ire is a replacement of neither cast ye your, per your pearls before swine with do not feed your pearls to pigs. <laughs> <laughs> Eliot suggests that the English public, country folk and town dwellers alike are still very much familiar with the word swine in all of its uses. He adds that the change from casting to feeding makes the figure of speech ludicrous. No animal can actually be nourished by pearls. Towards the end of his life, Eliot found himself in a position to influence the language of the liturgy more directly. He was invited to sit on a committee to revive the Coverdale Psalter. Other committee members included C.S. Lewis, the director of the Royal School of Music, a Cambridge professor of Hebrew, and two bishops. They met every two or three months from 1959 to 1963. We can get a taste of Eliot's arguments in the list of suggestions that he sent to the commission. On the spelling of show, he comments, why alter the old spelling, show with an E? I like it. <laughs> <laughs> On the substitution of kine for oxen, he suggests oxen ought to be kept, <coughs> quote, unless this is an adaptation for the wholly illiterate. Most memorably, the committee split over the famous line from Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. The proposal was to change the valley of the shadow of death to the darkest valley. Eliot was not in favour. And he thought he had won the day. Uh, Valerie, Eliot's second wife, reported that she remembered him coming in late one night from a meeting of the commission, and when she asked him how it had gone, he said with a tired grin, well, I think I've just saved the 23rd Psalm. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, he was mistaken. A majority of the commission approved the revision. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, matter. In the end, it was not Eliot who saved Psalm 23. It was the general public. His outcry when the new version appeared forced the church to think again and restore the shadow of death to subsequent versions. In one of the committee's final meetings, it was suggested that Eliot's name should be used to promote the sales of the revised Psalter. The minutes record some hostility to this idea. Mr. Davy remarked that in fact Mr. Eliot's positive contribution to the revised Psalter was nil. He had spent his whole time resisting any change. <laughs> <laughs> it is clear then that Eliot was deeply attached to the language of liturgy. But it would not be fair to interpret this attachment as mere stubbornness or resistance to change. Eliot had a sharp auditory imagination, and he was prone to what I like to call poetic earworms, words and rhythms that could obsessively make their way into his poetry again and again, creating patterns of all recurrence. It is no surprise that using the prayer book and going to daily services imprinted his imagination with the words and rhythms of the liturgy saturating it with familiar patterns of words and sounds. But Eliot's mind, you may say, was saturated with many things. And there is still a question, what, make the liturgical what made the liturgical language so special? Was the influence of the Anglican liturgy the same as that of Shakespeare, for instance, um, who also had an overwhelming impact on the development <coughs> of the English language and also filled Eliot's poetry with an intricate unshakable pattern of sound and echoes. Eliot would argue that there is a difference and that it lies in the question of belief. But I would go even further 
and suggests that the difference comes, da comes down to the very nature of liturgical language. Because liturgical language has something in common with Eliot's ideal for the language of poetry. Eliot's poetry is keenly aware of its own struggle for expression. This is a classic symptom of modernist anxiety. His poems consistently try and fail to say what they mean to bring order to the chaos of emotions and experience. It is impossible to say just what I mean, Eliot writes in Proofrock in 1911. And this concern will remain a constant strain throughout his poetic career. <coughs> in Burnt Norton, published in 1936, words strain, crack, and sometimes break under the burden, under the tension, slip, slide, perish, decay with imprecision, will not stay in place, will not stay still. The language of Eliot's poetry is a language which consistently fails and is painfully aware of its own limitations. In this context, liturgical language offers the possibility or holds up the ideal of language that works. Words that can stay still and still moving without cracking under the burden of human expression. Words that are precise, ordered and effective and if you combat bad revisions and translations will not be subject, subject to decay. Words that do not suppress the intensity of private emotions but reshape them to give them an impersonal, communal form. All of this was very appealing to Eliot as a poet. This is not to say, however, that Eliot thought poetry should straightforwardly imitate liturgical language, or worse, attempt to fulfil the same function. Poetry should not try to be a substitute for religion. Saying that poetry will save us, Eliot writes, is like saying that the wallpaper will save us when the walls have crumbled. Even when confronted with devotional poetry, which did not make any claims towards salvation, Eliot was generally wary and sceptical. When poetry attempts to be purely religious, he warns, it is merely doing something that the liturgy does better. So poetry must be and do something different. This point is absolutely crucial to understanding Eliot's use of the liturgy in his poems. Eliot's liturgical <coughs> borrowings are not devotional regardless of how many times they are quoted in Anglican sermons. In fact, there is often something about them that is far from orthodox. These are the sorts of things that Eliot does to the liturgy. He takes familiar lines and cuts them off at crucial points. He brings disorder into orders of service. He changes the context, the meaning and meaning of liturgical responses. He overlays sacred litanies with mindless nursery rhymes. He instills a sense of hesitation and anxiety within the confident formulae of collective worship. In the next part of this lecture, I will take you through some examples of these poetic strategies. I will show you how they work and why they are emotionally effective. And we get to decide together which of them constitute blasphemy. <laughs> Eliot did not like it when people called his poems blasphemous. In 1936, he wrote to his brother Henry that he had only written one blasphemous poem, <laughs> and that it was The Hollow Men. That is blasphemy, he explained, because it is despair. It stands for the lowest point I ever reached in my sordid domestic affairs. The Hollow Men was published in 1925, two years before Eliot's baptism. It was a low point in Eliot's dis disastrous first marriage. It had also been a dry spell for Eliot as a poet. After the magnum opus of The Wasteland, published in 1922, he had not been able to write poetry for three years except for a few fragments, and his failure tormented him. It comes as no surprise, then, 
that the hollow man takes place in the first circle of hell. It is heavily indebted to Dante's Inferno, specifically Dante's de depiction of the soul stuck in limbo, who yearn for the presence of God, but can never be satisfied. The Hollow Men is an exploration of doomed desire, spiritual emptiness and spiritual impotence. It is saturated with feelings of loneliness and failure, and as Eliot suggests, an overwhelming sense of despair. This is how the poem begins. We are the Hollow Men. We are the stuffed men, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dried voices, when we whisper together, together, are quiet and meaningless as wind in dry grass. Shape without form, shade without colour, paralysed force, gesture without motion. In the hollow men, language does not work. The men's heads are filled with straw, so the empty space inside cannot even resonate with, with sound. Voices are quiet, dry, and meaningless. Words and gestures have been hollowed out. This is the antithesis of liturgical language, where words and gestures are meaningful and effective. And yet, the poem keeps being drawn to liturgical words and rhythms. This is the case, especially in the fifth and final section of the text. The section begins with the tune of a nursery rhyme. Here we go round the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear. Then it moves on to three solemn stanzas made up of short lines, exploring the idea of in-betweenness and separation. This is one of them between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow. <coughs> Each one of these stanzas is interrupted by a short formula typeset in italics. For thine is the kingdom, or life is very long. Then these formulae themselves become shortened and interrupted. Finally, the poem concludes on what may be the most overquoted two lines in English poetry, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. <coughs> Eliot instructed that the section should be read without too much expression, with some parts resembling children chanting a counting out game, and some parts mimicking, I quote, the recitation of a litany. In the hollow men, even the liturgy sounds broken. And it is not merely a matter of tone. I would like to draw your attention in particular to what the poem does to doxologies. And I'm thinking of two lines, <coughs> uh, the line, for thine is the kingdom, and the line, this is the way the world ends. A doxology is a short formula of praise to the glory of God, often used at the end of hymns, psalms, and other prayers. For instance, in morning and evening prayer, all psalms are concluded with a glory be. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord's Prayer can also be followed by a doxology when it is said in non-penitential contexts. And this is it. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. These doxologies serve as ways of concluding and summing up a longer prayer, gathering together petitions and intentions. They provide both a point of arrival and a new beginning. They open up the human plane to the glory of the divine. They give us a taste of what the Catechism of the Catholic Church calls <coughs> the liturgy of heaven. But what happens? to the liturgy of heaven when it is thrown into the first circle of hell. <coughs> in Eliot's poetic imagination, doxologies start breaking down. <coughs> this is the way the world ends, is the rewriting of the glory be, but only as a grim parody where the promise of a world without end gets turned on its head. The world 
does have an end, and it doesn't even sound that great. The poem and the prayer <coughs> deflate. <coughs> the glory beat is not the poem's only doxological casualty. The liturgical ending of the Lord's Prayer is also falling apart, creating some of the most heartbreaking lines in the whole poem. For thine is the kingdom, life is very long. For thine is the kingdom, <coughs> for thine is, life is, for thine is the. From the original line of the doxology, Eliot had already cut off two things, the power and the glory. But as the poem draws to a close, even the words announcing God's kingdom become too hard to say. The poem tries and tries again, but the words will not come out, and we are left with a stutter. The liturgy is out of breath. What makes this device effective is that doxologies are such familiar liturgical prayers. Congregations know them by heart and often recite them mechanically, knowing and expecting what comes next. They can be taken for granted. But Eliot's broken doxologies cannot be taken for granted. They call attention to themselves. It is precisely because they're, they're, these words are so important, because they have such a hold on the poem's spiritual and auditory imagination, that saying them becomes almost impossible. I would like to disagree with Eliot. I don't really think this is blasphemy. Rather, these lines capture something crucial about the personal drama of a soul struggling with trust and prayer, caught between the weight of sin and the desire for God. This personal drama was familiar to Eliot. In a letter to Hell, he once condensed his biography into a broken doxology of his own. Life has so far given me three things, the horror, the boredom, and the glory. Our second poem is called A Song for Simeon. And it is written in a very different mood um, in the wake of Eliot's conversion. It ushers in the possibility of relief and consolation. The poem was published in 1928 as part of the Aerial Poems, um, a small series of seasonal illustrated pamphlets started by Faber and Faber, Eliot's <coughs> publisher. Um, and this is the wonderful illustration um, by Edward MacMahon Crawford. Um, in A Song for Simeon, the references to the liturgy are more direct than in The Hollow Men, and its modulations are more subtle. The poem, as you might have guessed, is a rewriting of the Nunc Dimittis, which is said or sung every day at evening prayer. Um, in the Catholic tradition, the Nunc Dimittis features a <coughs> compline or night prayer, a service which was progressively restored to the Anglican repertoire over the course of the 20th century. Um, the text of the canticle is taken from St. Luke's Gospel. Simeon um, is an old man who has been told by the Holy Spirit that he will not die before seeing the Messiah. When Jesus' parents take him to the temple to present him to the Lord, Simeon recognizes the baby as the saviour of Israel. He takes him in his arms and intones a prayer of praise and thanksgiving. And this is how it appears in the Book of Common Prayer. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to be a light, to lighten the Gentiles, and to be the glory of thy people, Israel. This would then be followed by the doxology of the glory be. It's the profoundly beautiful moment in the liturgy. The day is coming to a close. The service is moving towards its conclusion. In the words of Simeon, we ask the Lord to let us depart in peace. We give up all control. We are humbly asking for rest. Eliot's poems um, in general, and this poem in particular, um, this poem is haunted by the yearning for rest. Um, and in this sense, 
It works to intensify the liturgical emotion. But it does so in a slightly different key and in a slightly different order. Um, look, for instance, at what happens to the first verse of the Nong Dimittis. Lord, now, let thy servant depart, no peace, according to thy word. Um, in order to understand what Eliot is doing to the liturgy here, um, we need to read his work as belonging not merely to the English literary tradition, but to the English call tradition. I cannot think of many poetic rewritings of the Nunc Dimittis, but the history of English choral music offers many examples of musical adaptations. And here I am grateful to my musicologist colleague, <coughs> Dean Joan Behrens, um, for taking through for talking through this idea with me. Um, so in the service of Evensong, settings of the Nunc Dimittis um, are usually intended to create an atmosphere of quiet introspection. The first word, Lord, is often elongated, setting the mood and pace for the rest of the piece, as if the whole prayer were already contained in that one first note. Compared to the Magnificat, which can be jubilant and loud, the mood of the Nung Dimittis is soft, gentle, and contemplative. The only slight exception to this comes with the light to lighten the Gentiles. The word light is often accentuated, and it often starts a crescendo leading to the word glory, which itself announces the more rhythmic setting of the doxology. On the whole, however, the musical impression is one of calm. The music introduces a sense of denouement to support the notion that a covenant has been fulfilled and a blessing has been bestowed. Of course, these adaptations do not change the order of words, but their musical modulation help create a specific emotional narrative which is intended to enhance the congregation's effective experience of the liturgy. In the same way, I would like you to think of Eliot's poem as a musical modulation, a variation on a liturgical theme. Like a choral rendition, Eliot's poetic setting is soft, gentle, and contemplative. It also starts with the um, first elongated syllable of Lord. <coughs> but here comes... Um, Um, but here comes the main difference. Um, it takes Eliot 21 lines to reach the second word of the canticle, now. And it takes him a whole poem to reach the third word, let, with let thy servant depart, being the poem's penultimate line. Lord, now, let thy servant depart. The entire poem could be said to happen in the time it takes to sing the first note, or in the space of the breath that follows. This slowing down, this stretching out of liturgical time, helps support the canticle's atmosphere of calm introspection. But it also introduces nuances of emotion which did not feature in the poem's liturgical source. In the space of a note, a song for Simeon infuses the quiet confidence of the non dimittis with a sense of trembling, faltering, and anxiety. <coughs> what happens to the light to lighten the Gentiles is particularly striking. Eliot does use the word light in the first stanza, um, but he changes its meaning. Uh, its meaning. My life is light, waiting for the death wind, like a feather on the back of my hand. This is a beautifully delicate image, a feather resting softly on the back of Simeon's hand, ready to fly away with the wind of his last breath. This passage does not contradict the intent of the liturgy, but like the musical settings, it insists on a specific mood. <coughs> 
Simeon is ready for death. And he trusts the Lord, but he is tired. When the shining light finally appears, it is not triumphant, but only seen indirectly, scattered and refracted by particles of dust. Dust in sunlight and memory in corners wait for the wind that chills towards the dead land. Even the light of revelation has been made quiet. This is reinforced later in the poem with the whispery, whispery repetition of light upon light mounting the same stairs, which associate revelation with a sense of slow physical effort. The other moment of potential triumph, the glory of thy people Israel, also becomes tainted with a feeling of quiet fatigue. The word glory is paired up with the word derision, with glory and derision, sorry, you can't see it on this. Um, and the glory of Israel becomes a more intimate, understated reference to Israel's consolation. The poem also introduces the idea of pain. Um, Eliot dwells on Simeon's prophecy of suffering for Mary, quoted directly from Luke, and a sword shall pierce thy heart, thine also. The line, before the face of all people, becomes a temporal clause and takes on a much darker turn. Um, uh, before the time of cords and scourges and lamentation, before the stations of the mountain of desolation, before the certain hour of maternal sorrow. Eliot also introduces a penitential theme from the liturgy of the Mass in the form of quotations from the Agnus Dei, grant us thy peace. The phrase is repeated three times with a pronoun change in the third quotation, turning it more personal, grant me thy peace. Finally, the canticle's confident statement of vision, for my eyes have seen, is eventually denied to the speaker. Um, this is all in disorder. Never mind. <laughs> um, it's eventually denied uh, to the speaker. Not for me, the martyrdom, the ecstasy of thought and prayer. Not for me, the ultimate <laughs> vision. Simeon's readiness for death then culminates in a sigh of exhaustion. I am tired with my own life and the lives of those after me. I am dying in my own death and the death of those after me. I am fascinated by the poem's last two lines. Um, I might find them again, yeah. No glory, no doxology. The poem's conclusion looks like a direct quotation. Let thy servant depart having seen thy salvation. But note the subtle ways in which Eliot departs from the liturgical text. <coughs> I remind you of the original, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. In Eliot's version, there is no peace, the words have been cut off. The change from my eyes have seen a statement of fact to having seen alters the grammatical structure of the sentence and makes it ambiguous. Let thy servant depart having seen thy salvation could be rephrased as let me see thy salvation so that I can depart. The event of salvation becomes not a visible fact but the object of a petition, something that might happen in the future, a desired premise for the granting of rest. With this subtle grammatical change, softly, quietly, Eliot casts a shadow of doubt on Simeon's access to revelation. So these are the two examples of poems that are saturated with the language and music um, of liturgy in Eliot's works. I have said nothing about the wasteland or the plays. I have not even mentioned Ash Wednesday, um, which is 
more expressly Anglo-Catholic in its inspiration and especially in its use of prayers of Mary or intercession. Um, so there is more to say on this theme that I could possibly <coughs> cover in this talk, um, but I, ho I hope you will be inspired um, to read up a book of collected poems and dive in.